everyone. Welcome to the Affiliation of Christian Biologists event on Faith Science Curriculum for grades 6 to 12. Uh, my name is Brian Goyle. I'm president of the Biology Affiliate Group within the American Scientific Affiliation, and I'll be your host for the evening. Greetings to the ASA and affiliate members that are in attendance. That's roughly one third of you. And uh, the rest of you, nearly two thirds, have no formal connection to the ASA. And we're, we're glad you're all here. Uh, for the benefit of the latter group, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Dana Aleskowitz. She is the director of chapters and affiliates for the ASA. So I'll just give a, a quick overview of the American Scientific Affiliation is uh, over 80 years old. So um, we have been working in the science and faith arena for many decades. Um, we are scientists and Christians, as well as theologians, philosophers who come together to talk about science and faith issues. We have 4,000 members worldwide um, in the natural and social sciences, as well as I mentioned, theologians and pastors. The ASA chapters, including the Canada chapters with our uh, sister affiliation, the Canadian Scientific Christian Affiliation. We have 36 throughout the United States and Canada. We also have these affiliate groups that are based on discipline. So the affiliation of Christian biologists that are gathering this evening. We also have the affiliation of Christian geologists. We have an engineers and scientists and technology group. We also have the Christian Women in Science that has, is quite active. And then we just launched an affiliation of ministers, theologians, and philosophers. So our main mission is professional networking for scholarship, professional development, as well as for fellowship. Our sister organization is the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. We're partnering with them this year on our annual meeting. I'll give us some information on that in just a few moments. So just a, a real quick look at our strategic vision plan that was just rolled out last summer. Um, it has three legs to the plan, strategic vision and leadership intent, as well as the business model. And so um, I work in that space of the chapter and affiliate partnerships. And then we have individuals that work in stewardship and member services. And then each of the different areas on this wheel, so to speak, is what guides our work. We have our uh, YouTube channel has many of our events that have been recorded and posted, including this event will be eventually put onto our YouTube channel. We have the God in Nature magazine that has some great articles in it that's uh, published quarterly. We also have our scientific journal, Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith as well as uh, the Diving Deeper is a gathering on the second Saturday each month where we take a, an opportunity to talk in more depth about an article that's been published in the newsletter or on a book. Um, so you can get more information from our webpage. Our annual meeting this year, we're really excited to be in Toronto. We're partnering the um, CSCA. It's their 50th anniversary. And so we will be uh, gathering on uh, July 28th through the 31st. And then uh, Brian will give us some more information about the, this evening's event. Yeah, let me let me just say a few words first about the affiliation of Christian biologists, which is uh, hosting this event. Uh, as Dana said, the, the ACB is one of the affiliate groups within the ASA. And our mission is to encourage fellowship and networking among Christian biologists and to provide support to them really um, at all stages of their life, career, and education. Uh, we, um, we serve uh, as a forum for discussion of issues at the interface of mainstream biology and Christian thought. Uh, we educate scientists and the public about the harmony between biology and the Christian faith. And that's really, that piece of it is really what tonight is all about. Yeah. Um, and we uh, finally, we, we demonstrate responsible stewardship of God's creation and model the wise use of science and technology for the good of humanity in the world. That's, that's really our the mission statement for our uh, affiliation of Christian biologists. So with that bit of background, uh, let's move on to the main event. 
Um, and this slide that we're currently on shows our two speakers, featured speakers for the evening. Um, Faith Stoltz is program manager for BioLogos, and she will be speaking to us about the integrate curriculum that BioLogos has produced for grades six to 12. John Mays is the uh, director of science curriculum for classical academic press. He's also the author of several science textbooks that are produced by Novari Science, which is a part of classical academic press. Uh, tonight, John will be focusing primarily on the biology, life science, and environmental science curriculum within the Novari Science collection, but uh, he'll probably give us a quick peek at what else they offer. So with that, um, let me just say that that each, uh, both Faith and John will be each giving about a 20 minute presentation, and then we'll have a time of Q&A at the, during the last segment of the session. Um, so um, let's, uh, let's begin then with Faith. All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for coming out on your Tuesday evening or afternoon. Uh, and I'm really excited to get to share a little bit about our curriculum with you. So as Brian said, um, I am the program manager for the Integrate Curriculum at BioLogos. If you're unfamiliar with BioLogos, I'll share a little bit about our organization later on. But suffice it to say that we are good friends with the ASA, um, huge supporters of their work, and really excited um, to be able to share with your community a little bit about what we've been up to. My background is that I am a was a high school physics and astronomy teacher for a number of years um, in the Christian in a private. Christian school, and that's, I grew up going to private Christian schools and feel very passionately about the incredible value that a Christian education can offer students. Uh, but there are also some challenges and sometimes uh, shortfalls that Christian education can come up against. And in my experience, science education was one of those where I always felt like I had a little bit of uh, mixed messages coming from my teachers about science that you know, science is good and you should study it and it's God's creation and we should learn about the world around us. But also there's these pieces of science that are dangerous and trying to rob you of your faith and that you should reject out of hand. Um, and so one of the big passions of bio, the big passion of BioLogos is that um, there does not, not need to be a conflict or a choosing between what we learn about God through his word of scripture and through his world that he created, the natural world. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing to support educators in this space as they seek to integrate science and faith in their classrooms. So before I jump in anything, I would love to get your thoughts on a question. I'm assuming that most of you are coming from somewhere in the education space, either as um, K-12 teachers or professors or parents maybe. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts in the chat to this question. What goals do you have for your students? Or if you're not in the classroom, you can put on your imagination hat here. Um, what goals do you have for your students' science education beyond science content, knowledge, and skills? So let's take for granted that we want them to learn Newton's three laws and be able to uh, use a triple B measure, maybe a, just a digital scale at this point. Um, but what more do you want your students to get out of their science education beyond the, those science content and skills pieces? I would love it too if you could throw a few thoughts in there in the chat, um, get a few ideas going here. I'll give you a minute to think. All right, one, to see how science coheres with the Christian faith. Uh, want them to understand how to make practical use of the information. Absolutely. I think uh, students of all varieties, and I think in my personal opinion, particularly high schoolers, really care about that so what piece. So you want them to be able to understand why do they, why are they learning about science? How does it impact their personal life? And of course, the uh, cohering with Christian faith, uh, learn critical thinking, absolutely, looking at issues from various viewpoints, separating the science from the metaphysical assumptions, amen. Um, if Brian had given me another hour and a half, we could go off on a long conversation about the role of understanding the nature of science and the, uh, the methodologies of science and how understanding those, um, that alone can really help bring some clarity to some of these science and faith topics. 
uh, to learn that God created the universe, the world, nature, humans, um, how to understand what they see in nature, uh, that my students see how nature displays God's genius and not to feel threatened or alarmed by the disagreement among Christians about how and when God created. You guys are great. Keep them coming. Um, details of God's enormous works and care for each of us every second of the day. Yes, you can keep throwing those in there. I'm going to um, uh, move on, but you can get a sense of these things that there's, you know, we want our kids to learn science contents and skills, and that is very important, but there's so much more that we want our students to get out of their science education, particularly in a Christian context. Um, when I've asked other teachers this question, some of the common themes, much like you guys, um, we want our students to learn about God's nature through studying his creation, things like his creativity, how much he values beauty and diversity, um, and his, his patience for slow periods of time, um, understanding how scientific knowledge is developed. Um, you can read the rest of these for yourselves, developing Christian virtues through the practice of science. There's so much rich stuff that we want our students to get out of their science education. And for me, if I could sort of boil all of that down, um, simplify it a little bit for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'd call that, I would love my students to walk out of my classroom equipped to love God and love others through science, not just to understand the science, to be able to take that and have that um, enhance their ability to love God and love others. And that, when I think about science education in that context, I get really excited. Um, and that is one of the reasons why, as a science educator, I'm really excited to be working for BioLogos. Um, BioLogos <laughs> explores God's word and God's world to inspire authentic faith for today. Um, we originally started um, out as an organization founded by Dr. Francis Collins here, talking primarily about um, origins issues. And we've now expanded to include um, all sorts of topics from caring for creation and biomedical ethics and what it means to be human and anything that falls into this intersection of faith and science. But at the heart of everything that we do, we have our three core values, which is a Christ-centered faith, rigorous science, and gracious dialogue. Um, and um, particular, I mean, all three of those are important. Gracious dialogue is particularly important to us. Um, it's something that our students don't always see modeled very well in their world around them. And so I think being able to bring this idea that um, when it comes to some of these topics, there are multiple different views within the Christian community that faithful Christians who take the Bible seriously can come to different perspectives on. And that is okay. We are, we are all part of um, God's church and can share the communion table with each other, even if we have different views on how old the universe is and other things like that. Um, but we want to to be engaged in humble and thoughtful dialogue um, with, with others in that process. So that's just a real quick overview of our organization. And um, a quick caveat here that when, when we talk about science and faith, your mind, like most people's, probably jumps to evolution and the Big Bang. Um, and those are sort of big hot button issues. But there's so much more to this science and faith conversation. Things like climate change and gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, neuroscience, medical ethics questions, um, all sorts of things, reproductive technology, artificial intelligence, and so, so much more that um, is shaping the world of our students right now. They are engaging in these, um, or being, being influenced by a world that's shaped by these, these technologies and these um, uh, uh, experiences like climate change. And so it's think more than ever, it's vitally important for us to not just teach them the science behind these topics, but to really give them the resources to bring their faith um, and their relationship with God and their love for Jesus and serving people into conversation with each of these topics. So let me just make sure that it's clear that my goal in this presentation is not to advocate for any particular view. Um, and that's not even our goal with this curriculum. Um, but our goal is to equip teachers to help their students explore ways that their faith can inform these topics, to give teachers the tools they need to, to bring students into this conversation and help them develop those critical thinking skills to, to engage personally with their faith and science together. So with that, I have one more little chat assignment for you. 
because it's all well and good to say we should talk about these things, but that is not always an easy thing to do. So I'm curious, um, either from your own experience or or hypothetically, what are some of the challenges or risks for a teacher? I'm imagining a kind of middle school, high school teacher, probably at a Christian school, but maybe in some other homeschool settings, public school settings. What are some challenges or risks that can make it hard to address um, some science and faith topics in the classroom? What do you think? What are things that teachers might say, yeah, I'd love to, to talk about that topic, but X, Y, Z. Take a minute and share your thoughts in the chat. Lack of time to cover everything, amen. The, uh, the lack of instruction time is hard enough to just cover the standards that you're trying to work with. Uh, you might face hostility towards either, hostility towards, um, towards the science content or towards the faith content, uh, depending on your, uh, your situation. <laughs> Preconceived notions about what Hebrew words mean. It turns out that the Bible wasn't written in English and the linguistic and cultural interpretation process is challenging and complicated. All right, here are ooh, one more. Lack of time to develop rich curricular materials. Um, yeah, so you not only you need the time to teach the stuff, you might need time to develop the resources for your classroom. The threat of penalties for mentoring mentioning a caring creator as opposed to evolution. Um, yeah, so there can be uh, threats and pushback from various uh, groups of people. This list could be very, very long. Here are a couple um, that I've come across um, for myself and from other teachers. Like we already said, not enough uh, instructional time. Controversial topics can become divisive. We've all seen um, how divisive some topics, whether they're scientific or political, or theological could be in communities, and that's hard. So you don't want to bring that into your school community. You might not personally feel equipped to answer students' questions. There might be pushback from parents or administrators or the students themselves. Um, uh, wariness to support or reject specific views, kind of not knowing your audience, lack of support from administration, lack of curricular resources. These are all very legitimate reasons that and uh, that teachers, particularly teachers in a Christian setting, uh, might hesitate to address some of these topics. And they're all completely valid. And so the question that I think about then is, okay, so is our goal, if you think about all of those other things, those, uh, those goals that we talked about for our students' science education, many of them were at that interface of science and faith. Um, we want them to see God in creation, to see how science and faith can fit together, to be equipped to step into the public sphere and engage with science and technology topics that are shaping the world around them. Is accomplishing that goal of equipping students to love God and love others through science worth facing these challenges and risks? And that's a, that's a genuine question. There are some school settings where if you bring up these topics, you will lose your job. And I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for anybody to do that. Um, but it's, there's, there's a sort of challenge, risk, and uh, benefit um, balance here that I think teachers who are in the trenches very seriously need, you know, feel themselves torn between. Um, so a few little insight on this current generation to give you a sense of this. Um, we'll, you can read these for yourselves. Um, but I think these give you a little bit of a sense of the stakes, if you will, that it's, it's worth engaging these topics because the perception of our, our high school students today is that science and the Bible are not complementary um, and that you, you do have to choose um, and, uh, and that the church might be anti-science in some way and that that is actually feeling like Christianity is anti-science is one of the main reasons why young people are leaving the church today. Um, and so really, not that's not going to be a critical point of tension for everybody, but I think it's an important one to keep in mind that, um, that we, our students are going to engage in some of these hard topics. Um, and we want to, if they're going to come into contact with them, we want to be the ones to guide them into that conversation um, and help them understand give them the academic and spiritual and intellectual tools to 
to manage and, and, and make sense and think through what they believe and why. And so I think when you, when you approach science and faith in a positive way, you get some really exciting outcomes. Um, thinking about increasing student engagement, critical thinking, gracious dialogue, um, even building up Christian virtues. You can read these for yourselves. Um, but fundamentally, we can make science class a place for spiritual formation and personal growth, um, which is not always what people think of when they think of science class. So I know that was a little bit long-winded buildup to this curriculum, but I really want you to understand this is kind of the, the heart of where BioLogos is coming from and what we our hope is for students uh, that motivated our development of this curriculum. Um, the curriculum is called the Integrate Curriculum. The goal here is that we talked to a bunch of Christian science teachers, and they told us that um, when they looked at the, at the realm of curriculum and textbooks, most of what they saw fell into two categories. Either it was um, secular and the, the science content um, was consistent with the, uh, the consensus view um, of the scientific community, but it didn't provide them any resources to bring their faith into conversation. Or um, it was from a, a young earth perspective that, um, that they might not agree with and they didn't see many options in between. And I will caveat that with the next speaker actually does offer a, a middle ground there. So hold on to hear more about um, the Navari science textbook, which we're big fans of. But they really wanted something that could, um, a supplemental curriculum that could bring the faith piece into conversation with the science, particularly if they're using a science textbook, a uh, secular textbook. And so the idea here is that we've developed 15 different units, each with each which focus on a different topic within uh, the science and faith discussion, primarily in the life sciences realms. We're talking about cells, we're talking about DNA, evolution, and biodiversity, climate change, that sort of thing, and saying, here's the content that, you, that you're learning in your classroom or in your textbook. Now let's bring our faith into conversation with that and see, see where those two meet. So it's not intended to be a standalone curriculum. It's a supplement that would go alongside uh, a traditional biology curriculum. You could, however, if you wanted to teach a, say, a standalone science and faith elective course, it could certainly be used for that way. And there are some units that could fit very well into Bible classes or even some other science classes like a, a environmental studies or earth science or something like that. So that's an overview of the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum's goal is that we want the students to become faithful, informed, and gracious voices on the difficult questions raised by modern science. And um, I try to kind of keep those three words um, that resonate back to the core values of BioLogos, of a Christ-like faith, rigorous science, and gracious dialogue, that we want to sort of weave those three elements into everything that we do in this curriculum. And so some of the instructional themes and approaches you'd see throughout the curriculum, um, there's a lot of space for giving students the opportunity to ask questions and to reflect on their own, um, their own thoughts on a topic. So this, the goal of this, like I said, is not to teach one particular view as an organization, BioLogos um, affirms an evolutionary creation standpoint. And so the curriculum does um, start from a perspective of accepting the mainstream or the consensus uh, scientific view on biological origins through common descent, um, but that is not, the goal is not to convince people of that. The goal is to give students an opportunity to consider uh, the relationship between their faith and these various science topics. So it's a lot of discussion, a lot of opportunities for student reflection and um, sharing with each other about their views. Uh, we emphasize the nature and limitations of science because I think that's such a huge part of this conversation opportunities for gracious dialogue. And throughout this is woven a theme of culturally competent pedagogy, which if you're interested in learning more about that, I've got a journal article citation there for you. But the basic idea is just that recognizing that every one of our students is coming into our classroom with, with a whole life of experience that's going to be unique to them and will um, shape and influence how they understand and perceive information, whether that's cultural or religious or um, socioeconomic, all sorts of different pieces of who they are. And so how to sort of engage the whole students in that process. So with that, here are the 15 units. 
Um, each unit is guided by a, a central question, which you can see there. Um, I'll give you a minute just to kind of peruse those, but these are going to give you a sense of what the, the topic of conversation will be for each of these units. All right, so we've got kind of four different categories here. The first three units are, uh, we call them bundles, the strong foundation. So this is a basic under basic approach of, to the relationship between science and faith and how science can be a Christian vocation in and of itself. Units four through seven focus on um, the idea of design on a um, and human, uh, human, what it means to be human, I guess. So um, genetic diversity, DNA technologies, and also embryos in the brain and sort of what, um, what we can understand about human life through those. Units eight through 11 focus on origins. So we start with a unit talking about how we interpret the Bible and how interpreting the Bible relates to scientific knowledge. And then we get into evolution, the fossil record and, and human evolution in particular. And then the last four there are all about um, caring for creation, seeing God through his creation, uh, climate change, and also this idea that um, we are called to love people, particularly the least of these. And that um, one actually incredibly powerful way that we can do that is through caring for um, for the, the environment and the world that we live in that we are all dependent on. So those are some of the topics, um, all of the topics that we cover. Now in each unit, each unit um, of those 15 is made up of a series of modules and each unit will have at least one of each of these five modules. So each one will start out with a meat module, which is basically an introduction to a, a, um, a profile of a Christian, usually scientist, sometimes theologian, philosopher, depending on the topic, um, who lives out the relationship between science and faith in this particular area. So in, um, in the DNA technology one, you'll meet Francis Collins, the, uh, the director of the Human Genome Project. In Seeing God Through Creation, you meet a conservation biologist um, and learn about their work in studying different um, organisms and their role in the ecosystem and so on and so forth. And then there's a GROW module, um, which is uh, essentially a short devotion that focuses on one particular Christian value or virtue that is relevant to this conversation. So for instance, in unit one, we talk about the, um, unit one is a, a general introduction to the, to the relationship between science and faith and seeing them as uh, not in conflict with each other, but potentially two different ways of, of uh, learning about and understanding different aspects of the world that God's created. And so the Christian virtue there is humility. So it's a devotion on the idea of humility and um, knowing that we, we don't know everything and learning from each other in the process. Engage and experience are kind of your two meat and potatoes of the curriculum that will give you uh, activities focusing either on knowledge acquisition or application of something that they've learned um, in sometimes sort of a lab or experiential set. Now, the goal of this curriculum is not to teach the science. We're assuming that you are teaching the science contents using um, a textbook or whatever other curriculum you have. And so this is taking, taking that and bringing, taking the science into conversation with faith. So the new knowledge acquisition here would probably be, here's some faith components that will then bring into conversation with the science. And then last but not least is an integrate component. This is always our module. This is always the last one of the unit. And you can think of it as a summative assessment is a strong word, but at least an activity that's um, intended to bring all of these things together. You have the central question that framed the unit and then you get all of these pieces bringing in different components, um, different ideas into sort of the mix. And then the integrate module is where the student gets to bring it all together and reflect on their personal uh, views and understandings and responses to that central question. So sometimes that's a journaling activity. Sometimes that's um, a get out in the world project. Sometimes it's a, a hypothetical scenario. They, they all look a little bit different, but kind of give the students an opportunity to bring all of those pieces together. So um, probably I was, if we had time, I can, I can walk through what that looks like all in one here, but maybe we'll um, save that for Q and A if anyone wants to kind of walk through one unit. Um, so I'll just end by saying that 
In addition to this actual, the specific curriculum, uh, BioLogos offers a ton of other resources for educators. Our goal in this program is not fundamentally to sell a product, but to provide teachers with whatever the resources they, they need to be able to have these conversations in a fruitful full positive um, way with their students. Um, if a curriculum resource is helpful for you, great. If not, um, we've also got lots of other things like professional development workshops um, that can be offered in person or virtually to help teachers learn about how do you have gracious dialogue in your classroom or how do you talk to parents about these things. Um, we have uh, quarterly webinars. Uh, we have a speakers bureau if you're looking for guests to come to your school. Pop articles, podcasts, a newsletter, a community of educators on Facebook, and all sorts of other things. Um, so if any of that is of interest to you, you can check out our website, biologos.org slash integrate, and uh, get involved in what we're doing. And there you go. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Faye. That was great. All right, John. Thank you, everybody who's watching. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and talk about our curriculum. I'm in a really weird position. I'm uh, producing a complete curriculum, sixth grade through 12, that is unlike all other curricula, both secular and Christian. So um, pardon me if I, I try to present this like the uh, the unique thing, but that's that's kind of what it is, and I appreciate Faith for kind of alluding to that uh, as a uh, a curriculum that they embrace over there at BioLogos. We've been friends for a long time with BioLogos people. All right, so uh, here's how it got started. I, I started Novari Science and Math in 2009 and initially published uh, two little books. One was called The Student Lab Report Handbook, which we still have in print. And another one, which I called my manifesto, the teaching science so that students learn science. I'll talk in a minute about some things that will let you know where that title came from. Uh, we published our first textbooks, which were ninth grade physics in 2012. We started a um, sort of secularized version of our curriculum um, for charter schools in 2015 called Centripetal Press because charter school people started seeing what we were producing and wanted to use it, but we couldn't talk about Jesus in books that they wanted to use. So uh, Centripetal Press was born. And in 2020, uh, we became part of Classical Academic Press and our name was abbreviated to Novari Science. Uh, this is the book that replaced teaching science. Um, this is now our manifesto. It's called From Wonder to Mastery, a Transformative Model for Science Education. This book uh, includes both a description of the mastery learning model that I developed, as well as the philosophy behind all the different components in the curriculum. Um, significantly, I'll note that appendix in Appendix A, I include a uh, somewhat lengthy summary of the many, many meta studies that have been published about the thousands of articles on mastery learning. Uh, because I have a mastery learning model that we use in our curriculum, and I'm comparing it to all the re what's the what the models are that are used in all the research studies. So that's where that information is about our curriculum. Here's a brief overview of what we have uh, in print and what uh, how our program is organized. Um, you can see we have three books now for middle school students, life science, physical science, and earth science. Beginning in ninth grade, uh, we have uh, accelerated and grade level pathways. And um, both of the pathways begin with introductory physics. And uh, then the life sciences components in our curriculum are in the green circles here. Life science and uh, general biology are out now. Uh, advanced biology, which you could also call introductory biochemistry, uh, will be coming out in a year. And environmental science in two years. Uh, the way this program is structured, you'll notice the grade level pathway and the accelerated pathway sequences are different. 
And that is because of the alignment with mathematics. Um, I, I try to put chemistry with algebra two concurrently. So that means on the grade level pathway, that's, that's in the junior year, which means that biology comes before chemistry. And on the accelerated pathway, it's the other way around because chemistry occurs in 10th grade. Also, the ninth grade course for the accelerated path is not merely physics, but also physics and chemistry. So a running start to the uh, chem program, uh, at which comes prior to biology. So for, I know I'm talking to biology crowd here, this is a key element of our curriculum that in the accelerated pathway, um, we give an introduction to chemistry in ninth grade, which means the 10th grade book gets a running start. That, that accelerated uh, chemistry for accelerated students is 99% uh, of the AP syllabus for chemistry. And the uh, advanced biology book is 100% uh, of the AP biology curriculum uh, or syllabus uh, with also some additional things in there that are um, native, you might say, to our take on how to teach science, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, current, at, at present, the life sciences texts, uh, the two that we have out and the two that are coming soon, are in print only in the Novare Science imprint. Um, I plan to bring them out in the Centripetal Press imprint, but only after I get them all done. I've got to get the Novare line finished first if I have any time left after that, if the Lord gives me any time left on the planet after that, then I will uh, seek to realize these four texts over in the centripetal line. I bring up the centripetal line because many of you may be um, associated with charter schools um, in some capacity, and it would maybe be handy for you to know about it. Uh, but the centripetal line, uh, it does talk about the wonder of creation, but it does not talk about the creator in particular. That's the difference. Otherwise, the texts are the same. There are seven distinctive features, which I'm going to run through at light speed. Uh, that, but this is, this is what distinguishes us from the other publishers, both secular and Christian, of science textbooks. Uh, so number one is that uh, we place a huge emphasis on wonder and uh, as both Plato and Aristotle wrote, wonder is the beginning of philosophy. And of course, science used to be called natural philosophy. So that's important for us. Um, but I filled this slide with uh, biological wonder terms because uh, as I've been doing nothing but life sciences for the last few years, having uh, written and published all the chemistry and physics and physical science in the first part of our life as a company. And now we're into the life sciences. I've just been bathing in uh, meiosis and uh, homeostasis and, uh, you know, transcription and so on. And every single day I sit down at my computer and my jaw drops again. And uh, so this is a major emphasis of ours. Uh, Richard Feynman, uh, I noticed that he made a comment that I had made, uh, and it was lovely to stumble on something that Richard Feynman had already said, that um, we start with wonder, but when you discover something new, that just adds new wonder. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle uh, in science, and that's the way we look at it. And this is on uh, certainly on display in the life sciences uh, where uh, everything that you talk about is wonderful. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to these next the, the first three slides that I talk about here, uh, I want to say that um, this is I regard these three things as uh, kind of um, a pyramid of support for what our curriculum is, is really structured to to do. Um, Everything Faith talked about in terms of all the things that are not the science content per se, like all the stuff that goes beyond that, all your understanding of where does consciousness come from and why is there order in the universe and why are there laws of physics and why does anything exist? These are all these questions that go beyond the content of a standard science book. And I talk a lot about those things. Um, 
but but when I when I structure content for a curriculum for a class or a student, my uh, my goal I, is centers around this pyramid that has three levels. The first level is wonder, which supports the whole pyramid. The second level is integration, which is my next slide, and the third is mastery, and I will talk about that when we get to it. But the first three slides, you can think about them as the as the ground, middle, and upper story of this pyramid. Now, here's the second feature, which is the second uh, story in my pyramid. In the teaching of science, there are um, four disciplines that necessarily must be integrated into the science itself. And uh, if we don't do this, we are eviscerating the the real power of an education in science. I, I labeled this classical because these are elements that align with a classical way of teaching. Uh, so the first is epistemology. What is the nature of scientific knowledge? How does it differ from revelation from God? Um, or what are we doing when we do science? Um, I argue basically that science is the art of modeling nature. We develop models. And as John Polkinghorne has said about our models, John Polkinghorne being uh, both an Anglican uh, theologian and astrophysicist or particle physicist, um, he said scientific knowledge is both uh, provisional and corrigible. It, it is provisional because it's this is what we know right now and this is subject to change. It's corrigible because it's subject to being corrected. And um, that's that's the epistemology that I um, that we describe in each of our texts. Mathematics is the second area of integration. I taught for a number of years from those conceptual only books in uh, both physics and chemistry and discovered in the process that we were leaving out something of extreme value for every student, no matter their ability. And so I started teaching from those books and adding the math back in, and this eventually led to me writing my own texts, um, which reminds me that I didn't actually introduce myself back at the beginning, which I should probably do. So if you can look at my little uh, cameo up in the corner of your screen for a second, I'll tell you who I am. Um, I, I was an engineer, an electrical engineer for 15 years, and I went in and out of education because I felt drawn to uh, teaching. Um, and so I went into teaching, got a master's in education, but then my family and I were all starving to death. So we went back to engineering for another better than half a decade. And then uh, finally the draw was too much to uh, refuse. And so I was back into education. So I've, uh, I've taught at the um, public, in public schools, in uh, Catholic school, Episcopal school, Protestant, Christian, Catholic, classical school, and colleges um, over the last um, 30 years. Um, but my, I landed at uh, a classical Christian school in Central Texas where I developed these curricular ideas. I, I started there trying to solve two problems. One was how to make science teaching classical, and the other was how to solve the problem that comes up on the next slide. So there's a teaser. I'm going to leave it until I get to the next slide because I haven't finished this one yet. So there's my little uh, bio. Um, back to the integration. Uh, I've talked about the first two points. The third point, as you see, Rosalind Franklin is sitting there and um, history is part of the science curriculum. Wolfgang Goethe, as you all know, I'm sure, a, uh, an 18th, 19th century German writer of romantic literature and amateur uh, devotee of science. In his book, The uh, Theory of Colors, he wrote that the history of science is science itself. And so uh, I argue that the best way to understand how science works, which is what that graphic is showing over on the left side of the screen. I call that the cycle of scientific enterprise. That we have a theory that accounts or attempts to account for a group of facts. We draw hypotheses from that theory. We test them. We anal analyze our results. We look at whether the results support the hypothesis or not. 
if they do, the theory is strengthened. And if not, we go back and try to review uh, what happened because if we understood everything, it should have. Um, I call that the cycle of scientific enterprise. And the best way to understand how it works is to see it playing out in history. So in all our books, we put the history not in the sidebars where you can skip over it, but in the main uh, part of the text where we talk about the history of the scientific model and the history of the Copernican revolution and the history of uh, electricity and magnetism or uh, cell biology or life science and um, show that, that this is an ongoing process. Finally, the fourth area of in integration is language. Um, and uh, I feel like a voice crying in the wilderness when I talk about this because um, almost every science curriculum I can think of makes heavy use of multiple choice tests and so on. And uh, I argue that as human beings made in the image of God, uh, one of our primary quali qualities is that we are language users. And um, several have argued from the Helen Keller story and other similar stories that without language, we basically aren't functioning humans. We're essentially functioning at an animal level apart from language. And Helen Keller's story kind of illustrates this, uh, the way she was living an animal life as a child, both being both blind and deaf and not able to interact linguistically with the world. But her teacher uh, uh, was signing things into her hand all the time, trying to make a breakthrough. And one day she did. And when, when Helen realized that what she was being told was the names of things, that's when her brain basically switched on. And she began asking the name of everything. And she learned like a sponge. And she, as we all know, became a very eloquent writer uh, and a beautiful person. But it was all because of language switched on for her. So when I review how central all these uh, aspects of language are, to being human, I ask myself, why in the heck are we using multiple choice questions? Um, those are convenient for the teacher, but you know what? That's not who we're here for. We're not here for the convenience of the teacher. We are here for what's best, best for the students. What's best for the students is that they articulate scientific principles in their own words. They synthesize the language for themselves, and we hold them accountable for using good grammar uh, accurate use of technical words, uh, clear and unambiguous expression, and so on. So these are the four elements of integration that uh, are permeate all our books. So the top of the triangle that I um, described earlier, and one of the um, things I set out to do early in my pilgrimage as a, an educator, uh, I, I realized that the way all the students were going through their courses, not just in science classes, but in every class, they were, they were cramming for the test, they were passing it, and then went about three weeks forgetting everything. Every teacher recognizes what I call the cram, pass, forget cycle. And this cycle became as obvious as anything to me in about 2000. And I set out to figure out a teaching model that would uh, defeat this cycle and uh, restore joy to the classroom because to my mind the cycle is uh, connected directly with the uh, cliched hatred of school alice's cooper you know school's out forever um, kind of syndrome um, everything that's wrong with school uh, i mean there are a lot of other problems of course social problems and so on creating all kinds of crazy dynamics in classrooms but certainly a big one is the um the knowledge on the part of every student who's over the age of 12 that what they're going to spend the next year doing is jumping through hoops and having almost nothing to show for it at the end of the year. And so education becomes a joke. I wanted to reset that um, situation and come up with a different goal. So I set out to develop a teaching model that would result in mastery. And mastery, I define as a high level of proficiency combined with long term retention. And uh, that is what all our books are um, designed to support. And if you want to know the details, 
of my mastery teaching model, then I refer you back to the slide uh, on the, the second slide and my book, From Wonder to Mastery. That is the explanation of all the details of the teaching model that our texts uh, support. The heart of the, of the idea is that all the assessments in any class are cumulative to the start of the year or even before. So students are constantly being tested on old knowledge as well as new. They have to be taught how to study correctly so that they can survive under such a regimen, which means they are taught to practice, not just to forget what they've done before, but to practice, constantly practice what they've done before. Just like if you're learning Latin and once a week you get out your flashcards and you practice all those definitions of all the vocabulary, that's what we need to do with science content as well. Um, of course, these other integrative ideas that I mentioned on the previous slide, these are supporting this so and providing a lot of richness in the way we conduct the classroom. It's not just drilling with flashcards, uh, far be it, but uh, that would be part of it. Uh, distinctive feature number four is our unique approach to addressing the science faith issues that faith, uh, faith's uh, integrate curriculum is all about. Here are three bullet points summarizing our approach to three big uh, controversial uh, topics. On the age of the earth issue, you could state our position by saying, well, with respect to what other people might think, the evidence for a very old earth was already persuasive uh, a couple of hundred years ago. So we're going to take that one as, um, settled and in our earth science book we just adopt an old earth point of view and we go through the science um, we acknowledge on one page at the beginning of the age of the earth chapter that there are other christians believers whom we respect who have different views about the age of the earth and we respect that but that is not the view that we're presenting so on the age of the earth uh, issue we, uh, we take a position, uh, but we try to do so uh, graciously. Everything Faith said about respectful and gracious dialogue and, um, and uh, treating each other as uh, people with minds who are also made in the image of God, who we need to love, all of that I embrace wholeheartedly and um, talk about in, in many of the things that I've written. Our uh, second, the, obviously the mother of all um, controversies in science is evolution. Um, on this one, we take a different tack. Um, we don't take sides. We don't affirm that evolution happened. We don't critique evolution as a problem or as a theory that needs to be torn to shreds. We don't do anything except uh, present a faithful and robust presentation of the mainstream point of view that natural selection uh, and other factors have uh, brought about the present uh, 10 million or more species uh, via common descent. Uh, we present the, uh, the evidence that supports that uh, theory in the five major um, categories of evidence. Um, whoops, how did that happen? Somehow hit my escape button or something. Um, we, uh, we talk about the history of the theory and the various people who were involved in the early 19th century leading up to Darwin, uh, Lamarck and others. And, um, and, and we, uh, the main thing is, um, unlike all other Christian publishers, we do not critique this theory. We do not um, say that it's anti-God. In fact, at the beginning of every evolution chapter, we make a specific point of noting a couple of things. One, there's a big distinction between uh, embracing evolutionary theory and embracing atheism. And in Christian writings, these are often conflated. And this uh, aggravates me to no end. So we make a distinction here. This is not atheism we're talking about. There are a lot of Christians who embrace evolutionary theory. They're obviously not atheists. So we make that distinction very clear. 
Another distinction we make clear is the nature of scientific knowledge. As I you know, uh, pointed out in an earlier slide, uh, science is about modeling nature. We come up with a model that uh, represents the data we have before us to the best of our ability. That model says that, you know, the best way we have to account for the fossil record and the strata and so on is that there was a, a descending or, a, a, yeah, descending uh, or ascending, however you want to look at it, a sequence of fossils and complexity of life forms. And the theory of evolution is the best model we have to account for such data. Um, so we don't need to be afraid of this. Uh, this data aren't, uh, aren't to be conflated with uh, truth claims. They are scientific models subject to provis uh, provisional and corrigible, as Polkinghorne has described it. The, uh, a, a third big uh, controversial issue these days, as everyone in this uh, presentation knows, is climate change, but not just climate change, but um, environmental destruction in general. And we are um, we, we have presented this it, these issues in uh, short form in some of our prior books in like a little piece of a chapter on ecology. Life science has a chapter on ecology. So does general biology. Um, they treat, you know, lots of issues and these are some of them. Uh, we're doing the same thing in the uh, AP biology. But when we get to environmental science, we will be trading it in a great deal more length, as well as developing a theology of creation care uh, that is going to be in that book. But um, our approach to dealing with this will be pulling no punches. And we do, we do not pull punches in the books we already have out, even though they treat these issues only in brief. But uh, we will not be denying any of the science. We will be going with the mainstream. The environmental destruction and climate change are real, and uh, this is a very serious issue for us. But I will tell a, in a moment about how we uh, are going to deal with that in our environmental science uh, curriculum in particular when I get to that. All right, a distinctive feature number five, I'm going to accelerate a little bit here and go through this quickly. By, here's what we accomplished by putting physics in ninth grade before everything else. Before students have mat, uh, biology, our curriculum is a mastery oriented curriculum, which means they will have mastered uh, at a ninth grade level these five, these uh, four topics before they show up in biology. They will be able to talk about energy, charge, ions, and the electromagnetic spectrum. They'll know what the wavelengths are when you get to photosynthesis, uh, and they'll know what energy is before we talk about what's going on in the cells with ATP. And before they take chemistry, they will have had those four things, of course, but they will have these basic math skills completely mastered. Isolating variables, unit conversions, the metric system, scientific notation, uh, oh, metric prefixes I listed separately, and significant digits uh, without the addition rule, which we leave for chemistry. Um, I always ask chemistry teachers, what would it mean to you if all your students coming in already had a complete mastery of unit conversions and the metric system and the metric prefixes. And they always say, well, that would make my life a lot easier. And that is exactly what happens. So that's, that's, um, that's our fifth distinctive uh, feature. Our sixth is that we, I care a lot about textbook aesthetics. Um, I'm classically minded and, um, Beauty is one of the transcendentals. It's a classical ideal. Uh, these samples of page layouts are trying to illustrate that we use clean pages that are colorful and beautiful. Uh, these books are sewn hardcover books. They have sewn bindings. It's impossible for the pages to come out. The matte paper is coated and the printing is not digital. It's off, four color offset, which means you get these rich colors which hopefully you will view as I do as tasteful and that the uh, you'll see the page layout as uh, promoting reading rather than getting in the way of reading uh, as books do when they're designed to look like websites rather than textbooks. Number seven is uh, I would not have put this on the list 10 years ago, 10 years ago or 13 years ago, I would have said this would be my ambition or my goal for writing books. I wouldn't have claimed it. 
I, I only put it on the list now because I've had hundreds of students come up to me and say this statement. When reading the book, it's just like you're here talking to me. And so I know from talking to them that the um, writing is successful with students. It's easy for them to read and easy for them to comprehend. Now I will wrap up with uh, a few slides here, highlighting some of the features of our life sciences and biology curriculum. I'll start with the sixth grade life science book. And a lot of these features apply to all the books, so I won't necessarily need to repeat everything for every slide. Um, our life science books, life science and general biology, they both balance the macro world against the micro world because of the nature of biology today. We need to learn about uh, plants, but we also need to learn about cell biology. Uh, it can't be strictly macro or micro. Um, all these texts include chapters on ecology and evolution. And we developed a new uh, paradigm for the lab book to accompany all these life sciences books. And we, I call it the apprentice's companion, the apprentice's companion to life science, the apprentice's companion to general biology and so on. The images on the right are um, a few pages out of the apprentice's companion uh, for life science. And um, the idea here is that this, is a this book is a combination, experiment procedures, lab journal, commonplace book, sketchbook, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, there's poetry, there's history, there's technology, there's art, all kinds of things are represented in these books. The whole idea is to make the Apprentice's Companion series a, a delightful field of play and um, observation and experiment and journaling and reflection. Uh, for students uh, in the life sciences. Here's the list for general biology. It's very similar. Um, in fact, it's the same, uh, but those page, those sample pages are from the apprentice's companion for that. That dark blue green region is a quote from the strange life of insects uh, by Edwin Teal, a wonderful uh, book. It's a little quote about water striders that I found and put in there on that page on properties of water. So that's the kind of stuff that these books are full of. Um, this is the one we're uh, just wrapping up work on now. Um, actually today, uh, finished first drafting all the chapters and um, we, the review process is underway and this book is scheduled to come out next year. Even though that image on the left says author name at the bottom, I can assure you we do know who the authors are. That's a placeholder uh, cover. We haven't finished the cover yet. Now, uh, we have the items in this book that we have in the other books that I've shown already, but in here as well, I put in that this book covers the AP syllabus for biology. But, with, but in addition to that, we have the history and epistemology that we have in all our books. It's not just the AP syllabus. Uh, it's AP syllabus plus everything that makes us who we are. And uh, finally, uh, we don't even have a mock-up cover yet for this for environmental science, but uh, Mark and Karen McReynolds, who we found out about through the environmental uh, Christian environmental organization, Arosha, uh, uh, they are the authors, co-authors of our environmental science book and are about half done in their first draft. And like uh, the previous book, uh, this will be the AP syllabus plus our history and epistemology, plus in particular, a pretty lengthy treatment of the theology of creation care with a goal of demonstrating that this is what we need to be about. As the Arosha people like to put it, uh, we need to uh, worship God, make it part of our worship to love the creation as he loves it and by caring for it. Uh, the book will take climate change, pollution, eco-destruction seriously. But um, when Mark McReynolds read my um, little prospectus for how we were going to do this book, which was, a, which was um, oriented around, we're not going to do finger pointing. We're just going to focus on what do we know and what can we do? He loved it. He said, I want to write this book. And he said, I want to add a third 
goal to this. Uh, I want to do all of this with a positive tone, a message of hope, so that our uh, high school students who are staring into the future, uh, sometimes very bleakly, um, can come away knowing, wow, God has us in his hand and there are things we can do and let's, let's get going. So that is our uh, attitude as we prepare that text. Uh, this is my final slide. Uh, if you want to look more about our books, uh, the Navari curriculum can be found at classicalacademicpress.com. The centripetal curriculum is not listed on that website yet. It will be someday, but right now it's got its own website, centripetalpress.com. And that is the end for me. Uh, thank you, John. Now, now we'll enter into a, a period of Q&A. Um, while we're waiting uh, for questions, um, I have a question that I'd like to ask. Um, and uh, I guess this is directed to Faith. Um, Faith, you mentioned that the Integrate curriculum is not really intended to be a standalone curriculum, but would be a good uh, supplement for curriculum produced by Navari Science, for example. Do you have any guides that um, that make recommendations for which units would would correlate with um, specific chapters in the textbooks produced by Navari Science? Yeah, we are we are working on curriculum maps that do just that for a handful of the most popular textbooks that people use. So Navari is definitely on our list and would highly recommend Navari as a potential textbook to pair integrate with. Um, right now, the only textbook that we've developed that curriculum map for is Miller and Levine, which is kind of the standard high school biology um, textbook that is most widely used throughout um, the U.S. And so that's a probably a 10 page document that goes unit by unit through that textbook and says, here's where we would plug in each, not just each unit from Integrate, but each module um, and um, and sort of weave those two together. And so that resource is nearly ready. And then we plan to do that also for Campbell, which is a sort of standard AP biology, secular textbook. And then um, Navari would be um, high on that list as well, for sure. Okay, good. Fred Cannon, why don't you unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Yeah, so John and Faith, I really appreciate you putting this together. It's an incredible amount of work. Um, and, and a beautiful balance. Um, my question has to do with what is your reception, A, among Christian schools, harder school types and public schools? Uh, do, you, do you find that a lot of the Christian school teachers are saying, well, I'm, I'm young earth and I don't think evolution happened? Or are you hearing, oh, it is a breath of fresh air when you are open to it? Or what, what's, what are you seeing in, among American Christian schools, especially. John, I'm curious, you've, you've been kind of in this space a little longer than I have. Um, it depends on which conference you're at. Um, uh, I, I, I do, uh, I, I go to conferences with the great homeschool convention, several of them per year. And I also go to the, um, uh, association of classical and Christian schools and the, uh, Society of Classical Learning Conferences. Uh, the classical conferences, although there are a lot of young earth uh, creationist types at those conferences, they are at least equally matched by those who, uh, who have a different understanding of things. At the uh, greater homeschool conferences, uh, the balance is a little more toward uh, people who have a young earth understanding. So I find myself in lots of conversations with people. Um, I like to tell them this story, <laughs> which happened the year our um, Earth Science book came out in, uh, I think it was 2015, uh, a, a head of a school, a classical Christian school, uh, came up to me at the conference and he said he was going to use our Earth Science book. And he said, our entire school community is young earth creationists. And I said, um, wow, well, you know, our book is not that. He said, yes, that I know. I know that. And I said, well, um, how are you going to manage that? 
And he said, uh, well, I know this, your earth science book is the best. So that's the one I'm going to use. And then I'll deal with how to contend with the young earth angle. I'll deal with that back home. Now I, I, I heard that and I thought this is, um, this is the kind of courage, uh, that I would like to hear more frequently. Um, uh, the reason our company is successful is because lots of science teachers who have degrees in the sciences and who know that interpreting Genesis is not so simple as reading it literally. Um, they are fed up with the uh, pseudoscience that they're getting elsewhere and they are adopting our books and then they have to go through the gauntlet to get them approved and so on. But they're they're working hard to get that done, just like that head of school who said about our earth science book. When we published the earth science book, I thought, well, this is it. Either we're going to lose most of our customers or something else is going to happen. And, we, you know, I think we lost two customers out of, you know, hundreds back in that time. Um, since then, I've been approached by many teachers and heads of school and homeschoolers with the same attitude about this question. Thank I, I thank God for you that you're doing what you're doing. That's what they all say. Thank you for being you. Thank you for presenting what you are presenting. We need this very much. So, so I guess my short answer with that background uh, to your question, Mr. Cannon, is uh, there's still much work to be done. There's still much work that Faith needs to do with her curriculum and that I need to keep doing with my curriculum uh, and that all the teachers who are using these things need to do in their institutions and in their families. There's just a huge amount to do, but things are different from what they were 25 years ago. There's no question about that. Things are shifting. Uh, young people who are coming out of college now are much more likely to have a point of view that says, look, we can't keep denying the science. We need to do better work on our theology, you know, our hermeneutics, because that's where the work needs to be done. If I've taught my whole life that the earth was made in six literal days, uh, it uh, sounds like I'm in the Copernican revolution time all over again. And basically we are, it's just that this time is taking more than a hundred years to work it out. Um, you know, they got the Copernican revolution done in about a hundred years. It's taking us about twice as long apparently. Uh, but the things are moving. So, um, I'm very encouraged every time I go to a conference and these people come up to me and say, you know, the reason we adopted your curriculum was because you were the one who was saying that we don't need to be afraid of evolution and that the earth is old and that climate change is real. Um, so I'm very and very encouraged by that, even though I also have people come up and say, well, your curriculum is not for me. So. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. That's very consistent with my experience. You, you get people who don't ap approve of what you're doing and let you know that, but the vast majority of people are, um, at least respectful, and there's always um, a a significant and growing population of teachers who see the value of uh, the types of curriculum that John and I are working on and um, are getting engaged. So, Faith, I would add, you're, what I see in yours is this is very good for parents that have kids going to public schools because you're mm -hmm. not replacing their books; you're augmenting them. Uh, are, are you finding mm -hmm. a uh, a market, a home for that kind of use of your books? Yeah, we tried really hard to make Integrate useful in a lot of different settings. So the two primary uh, sort of audiences that we had in mind were teachers at private Christian schools and home educators, Christian home educators who wanted a, a different option beyond Young Earth Creationism. Uh, so that's really who it's targeted to. But um, parents of, of students at who attend public schools and all the youth ministry settings and that sort of thing are, are great. Um, you know, would be very, very benefit from this uh, curriculum. The curriculum has only actually been out for a year now, almost exactly. So we're still just getting the word out there and trying to find our footing in how to, how to reach people just to let them know that this exists and getting feedback and learning about 
how it can be used best. Uh, but certainly that's a group that we would love to get this into the hands of. I'd like to say a word about Integrate. Um, Faith uh, paid me the compliment of saying that they like uh, the Navari curriculum over there at Biologos. I'd like to return the favor. Um, last year, when the curriculum was finished, I bought I bought a copy and downloaded it and started going through it. I read through four different units out of the 15. I read through four in detail and watched every one of the videos, went to every link, read every paper. I, I went through four of the units exhaustively uh, to get a feel for the curriculum. And I was completely uh, just overwhelmed at how, at, at, well, at, new, at several factors, but um, it was not what I expected. I expected, like, we're going to go in and help people understand why evolution happened. And I just didn't expect the level of subtlety and the level, level of caution and the level of sensitivity uh, from the very first unit. Uh, they're talking to people where they are in a very gentle way, telling the stories of how, where, how we got, you know, how we deal with science and how we, you know, our upbringing and our uh, ways of understanding how God uh, talks to us about the world. And then gradually getting into more and more sophisticated ways of having this conversation and, and then going in deep. And after going through those four units, I was, I was completely impressed. I thought this is one of the best curriculums I've ever encountered. I couldn't find a rough edge anywhere. So um, I heartily endorse the curriculum. I mean, the full curriculum is basically, as Faith said, a year long um, uh, elective credit course in a science and religion class. It would qualify for that in a high school curriculum. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite good. I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier that we have this curriculum available and uh, I actually had a woman email me uh, last year and say, uh, what would you give to us um, if we are young earth creationists trying to understand the other people's point of view? And I said, well, here are four resources. And I went down the list and uh, I think the second on the list was um, just go to the BioLogos website. And the fourth on the list was look at their integrate curriculum. Uh, being the most intense uh, engagement with that question. Tim Hoymier has a, a question. Can you unmute yourself, Tim, and, and go ahead and ask it? Okay. Am I on? Yes, you yes. are. I, I, I've done Zoom quite a lot, but on my tablet, I'm a complete neophyte, apparently. <laughs> okay. So um, I've I'm a retired physics uh, uh, professor. Um, it's been on my heart to to help, particularly young people, but anybody who will listen. Um, that they, uh, it's a false choice between faith and science. And one of the things I've used is the idea that there are core ideas uh, as uh, done in the Apostles' Creed, for instance, core values. Um, in the Christian faith, and other things are not core values, and that devout believers who know the grace of God uh, differ on those. And I'd, I'd like to just say, uh, uh, John, that you're, uh, I took a look at uh, um, uh, the biology, you know, online, and uh, you, you have uh, something in the FAQs about uh, um, your stance on evolution, and uh, you have a very w wonderful, um, a, 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 what I think is a very balanced view, and that, that really is is the one I've been trying to get across. You said that Christianity is a big tent, and people disagree about secondary issues, which I thought, oh, that's a good phrase. I, I hope you don't mind if I borrow it. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, that there are many issues that people of faith disagree about, uh, but they needn't, uh, they shouldn't uh, involve uh, uh, breaking fellowship. And, uh, and uh, but I'm, uh, so 
you know, there, there is a pervasive idea about, about some of these things that, that, that you and I might think are secondary issues, but other people think are core issues. And I'm tutoring my, uh, my grandson in uh, physics. Uh, he's a ninth grader. And his textbook, uh, from, a, from a Christian point of view, actually had a quote I saw, to my horror, that uh, um, uh, evolution, the devil's uh, most wicked tool, something like that. And I was going, Ugh. it's in my uh, physics textbook. So I'm not trying to, when, when I talk to the students, I don't push either one or the other, young earth, old earth. For Tim, do you have a question that you want to ask? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm a, such an academic. Um, yeah, so do you guys have any ideas as to how to get more people on board with understanding that Christians do have diverse views other than or, or beyond uh, these fine curricula that you do, you developed? Well, if, if I could weigh in, um, the, the first thing is just to say the fact Christianity is a big tent. I mean, worldwide, worldwide, I think uh, the number of Christians who embrace evolutionary theory exceeds the number who don't. And um, I think that's important for our students to understand that, that we, we live in a kind of a bubble here. But uh, more sub substantially, I guess I would say um, there are two passages in the scripture that I think need to be front and center when we're talking about this. And the first one is, uh, I call it the thief on the cross argument. You appealed to the um, uh, Apostles' Creed, uh, which is uh, good, but um, the, the thief on the cross went to paradise that day. And he didn't know a single thing, except mm -hmm. that the guy on the cross next to me is it. He's the center of the universe. I don't understand a thing about it, but all I need to do is say, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And his answer is done. You'll be with me there today. So I call this the thief on the cross argument. This is the minimum of what is uh, needed for uh, entering into God's kingdom is trust in Jesus, nothing else. So all the age of the earth stuff, all your approach to biology, all your views about communion, everything, that's all secondary. Jesus is it. That's primary. And if you want to say, okay, we have a few other primary doctrines, fine. Kind of have a, a short list, you know, the Trinity, uh, so on. Uh, but I center on the thief on the cross, okay? His faith was, was saving faith as bare bones as it was. And it had nothing to do with his understanding of the age of the earth. Uh, the second key passage is John 17, where Christ specifically, overtly prays, knowing humans the way we are, that we're going to disagree about everything. He prays to the Father that we will be one, as he and the Father are one. And moreover, that the world would know that the Father sent the Son by the fact of our unity. Mm. This tells me that we are way out of line, that we are spending all our time bickering, and we have, ex we have now spread the bickering to go beyond biology to politics and government and everything. It's now the Christians bicker about everything. And it's the exact opposite of what the Lord prayed for us. So, so what I um, encourage my students to think about is, and teachers when I'm speaking to them, is uh, Christ's final prayer. I mean, his last big teaching through that prayer to his disciples was that we would be one. And he did that knowing that we were going to disagree about everything because that's just the way we are. So I, I say then we need to live up to that prayer. We need to say, yeah, we all disagree about everything. So what? I disagree with my kids, my wife. I disagree with my dog if I had one. We all disagree about stuff. What we need to do is learn to love each other anyway. 
That's mm -hmm. what he wants us to do. Love each other anyway. Say, you know what? I disagree about with you about that. Can I get you another cup of coffee? Can I wash your car? Can I, you know, take out the trash? Love each other anyway and recognize that the things we disagree about don't have anything to do with whether we're saved. They just have to do with our uh, present journey through the process of understanding the relationship between the world God made and our endeavors at understanding it. And that's a process we're always on, everybody. So uh, disagreeing about things is um, not only counterproductive, it's, um, it's just out of step with what the Lord uh, has basically commanded us to do, which is love Great. one another. That's well, well done. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. We'll take one more question. Uh, Joseph Long, you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Thank you. Uh, I, I love this. I love everything about this. Um, this is a much more practical question. I am on the curriculum committee for a recently established ACCS school here in the Rochester area. Um, I also happen to be employed as a philosopher uh, I, I, as a, 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 a philosophy department. Um, I do philosophy of science. So this might seem a little meta, but at the same time, I intend it to be pr fairly practical. Um, if I understand the Navarre approach to understanding scientific theories or scientific claims, it goes essentially like this. We should not evaluate scientific theories so much in terms of their truth, proximate truth, so on, but rather in terms of power, which I take to be something like kind of a broadly instrumentalist approach. On the other hand, if I read BioLogos, which I haven't read enough of the Integrate uh, curriculum, but at least BioLogos broadly, I would take their approach to be to scientific theories, say the theory of natural selection to be, actually, no, it's pretty close to true. Um, I'm imagining if we were to say, as the suggestion is, to combine Navarre and integrate, put those two together and have our teachers teach this, then the question is, how would our teachers approach the theory of natural selection? Would they approach it as something that is not to be evaluated in terms of truth, or is it something that should be evaluated in terms of truth, but here's all the evidence for it. I'm just trying to think about our teachers. How would they present this, assuming as we want to do in our school, we want to have a very, very much a big tent approach to this. Yeah, I think that's um, one, an excellent question. Um, the, the integrate curriculum, I probably wouldn't get that deep into the philosophy of science to really point in one direction or another, as far as like an instrumentalist approach or this sort of truth um, direction. The, they're definitely, um, making an argument or at least presenting the idea that that the natural selection makes a claim and here are pieces of evidence that support that um but it i wouldn't frame it as therefore it is true i think i mean i personally am inclined towards that um that uh explanatory power um sort of definition of a theory of a theory and there is some emphasis one of our units the second one is essentially epistemology of science and faith and sort of the differences and similarities between those two and a big emphasis within that in the science area is what um, I think John was mentioning sort of Polkinghorne's comments about science being tentative. It is um, the, the tension that I've often heard it framed as is tentative but trustworthy in a sense of there's rigor to the way that we come about. We arrive at these claims that we make such that they're not um, insignificant. There is evidence and, um, and support behind them, but nothing in science is ever 100% proven. There's nothing that we can write into stone now that could never be undone um, pending new observations and new data. And so it is tentative in that sense. Um, and that uh, I think we, we at Biologos describe uh, evolution as the best current model we have, um, evolution through natural selection, uh, to explain the, the genetic or the uh, biodiversity that we see. Um, but who knows what future uh, research and findings could, could unfold. I'll, I'll just add a couple of things to that. I'm looking at Terry Gray's comment in the chat box. He says, I would prefer using the idea of approximate truth rather than uh, instrumental a view of what a theory is. I think uh, that's probably more 
along the lines of what I uh, have put in our texts. I don't actually use the word instrumental anywhere. Um, what I do say is uh, echo quotes that I found across the board in scores of different scientists who say what we hope is that our theories are getting closer and closer to the truth as time goes by. Um, but that right, but that at any given time, the best we can say is we hope for verisimilitude, meaning this is something like the truth. If it's not the truth, it's something very much like the truth. It's still tentative. But we hope that as we develop this over time, it gets closer and closer to the truth. And of course, knowing that at any time, you know, the whole uh, model of particle physics can be thrown upside down uh, at any moment. Uh, so we know that can happen. And it has happened many times uh, when, you know, we have a paradigm shift. Uh, so uh, I do, uh, aff I do affirm that uh, what we all intend is our theories are getting closer and closer to the truth. I also like to affirm that as a believer, um, and I, I haven't written on this, I've spoken about it in numerous talks at ACCS and SCL and other conferences, uh, that um, as Christians, we need to advocate uh, for not only efficient and material causes for the world as we see it, but also the other two that Aristotle articulated, the formal and final causes. And this goes back to what Faith was saying about this, the things that aren't part of the content of the science itself. I want students to know how to calculate density, yes. I want them also to know uh, why explaining homeostasis is really hard because, and it may be as Scott uh, Turner has written, it might, it might not be doable from uh, strictly material and efficient causes, because there is a God who makes things that are alive live. Uh, Psalm 104 essentially says when they stop living, it's because he takes their breath away. God is the life source that, you know, the vitalism, if you will. I like Scott Turner's book, Purpose and Desire. I think it's a great example of how science has uh, often talked itself into a corner because it's stuck on material and efficient causes. So as a Christian teacher, I, I tell students and teachers, we need to also realize that things exist for a purpose. There is a final cause that they exist. And there is a formal cause. They are not random in their uh, nature. They are the way they are because God wants them in some way or another to be the way they are. Of course, there's a, there's a fallenness to creation too. There's a damp, there's, all creation groans as Roman eight tells us. So we have to factor that in too. David Hart has told us to, you know, recognize this dual thing about um, earth. Uh, it's the most beautiful, stunning, jaw dropping, wonderful place there is. It's also in bondage to uh, suffering and decay. And so we, we have to recognize both these things. And part of our theology is working on how do we understand that? Well, we need to uh, bring this to an end here. Uh, thank you so much, John and Faith for joining us this evening. This has been a tremendously informative session. And uh, I hope that it has whet the appetites of uh, our, our attendees uh, to find out even more, maybe even uh, get a direct look at, at the curricula um, at conferences or purchase it outright based on what you know. Um, this has is, this is, uh, been really helpful. Thank you again, both of you. I wonder if um, uh, Carl, Carlos uh, uh, Pinkham, if you could unmute yourself and, and close us in prayer. Thank you, Bruce. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have created such an incredible universe, a universe that we could study for our lifetime and the lifetimes of all the people on the earth today and still not comprehend even a small portion of the beauty and wonder 
and awesomeness of your creation. Thank you for Grace and for John and the effort they're undertaking to make comprehension of what we do know something that is meaningful and lasting. Thank you for the affiliation of Christian biologists and the vision that hopefully everyone will start seeing that you have given us. And all these things we pray in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I should have uh, mentioned that uh, Carlos is the vice president of uh, the Affiliation of Christian Biologists and uh, has made a great contribution to the leadership here. Well, thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, having additional Zoom sessions, probably not until uh, September, but we'll be working on making, we've already started making plans for our next sessions. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you join us. Uh, um, and also stay tuned for an email that I'll send out about how you can gain access to the, uh, the uh, EndNote database that I created for uh, all the articles and editorials and uh, letters to the editor and, and uh, most of the, or many of the book reviews uh, that have been published in the journal. Well, I've got, I've created an EndNote database with that I'm gonna share online. And so if you're interested, um, you can send me an email, but I'll, I'll spell it out in more detail and in the, the email that I send out to all of you. All right, God bless you all. And uh, hope you have a great, a great evening and a great week. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you.